and how well this week parks canada designated the former shing walk residential school in sault ste marie ontario as a national historic site now this residential school operated for almost 100 years and closed in 1970 indigenous children from ontario quebec the prairies and the northwest territories were forced to attend the institution it was run by the anglican church and 72 children are buried in the school cemetery including the uncle of our next guest. Joining us right now is Jay Jones, president of the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association. His late parents, Susie and Vernon Jones, were both Shingwalk Residential School survivors. He joins us in Waterford, Michigan. Jay, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for asking me. Now, both of your parents, as we say, are residential school survivors mm -hmm. and, and specifically survivors of the Shingwalk School. So what does it mean for you to have that institution now declared a historic site? Um, first and foremost, um, it will always be here. It's, it'll be a piece of history that um, people can learn from. They'll drive by and they'll, they'll see the school and that recognition will um, allow the story to continue far after we're all gone, the ones that have the stories. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because there are many residential school survivors who have asked and wanted their former schools to be destroyed and they have been demolished. Why is it important for you, do you think, to keep this alive versus destroying the school despite all its painful memories? Yeah, the um, alumni association I work with, um, they're all elders. All of them are um, Shingwak residential school survivors and that is their wish to um, keep that building there. As a reminder, of the history and so that history will never be repeated again and that's their main that was their main goal in seeking this rec this recognition of of a historic site mm -hmm. now as we say your parents were both survivors of the school I i'm wondering what the impact of that has been on your life we we hear we talk about intergenerational trauma but what does that mean to you well on my dad's side, there's four generations of residential school survivors. And on my mom's side, there's two generations. So each generation, as a child, that child did not receive love. They didn't receive hugs. They didn't receive um, Christmas presents. Um, they didn't receive any words of affirmation. Um, they weren't taken to their sports games and stuff like that. What they did receive was mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse. And when you have generation after generation with that type of atmosphere, um, these, I, I mean, we're products of our parents. So when our parents don't have the certain skills to raise a child correctly, then there's gonna be more issues in that family. And just myself alone, I, I you know, as I get older, I, uh, I see things that are Indian residential school effects. And I recognize them, so I know I have the ability to make that change and correct it. And it's taken me a long time to do that. I mean, when my son was under 18 years of age, um, we had a great relationship. But once he turned into an adult, it, it, our relationship kind of suffered a little bit. And I've recognized that, and I've heard that from a few elders lately, how, how, that, how that just happens. And... Um, it's these certain skills that you don't possess and it's handed down from each generation. So, and there's so many other things, you know, the, just the emptiness. Um, um, I taught my mom how to hug. She tells people I taught her how to hug. She never hugged us. She never told us she loved us, but she did other things that showed us that she loved us. So there's many, many, I mean, that's a, we just like touch the surface of all of the intergenerational effects. Yeah, absolutely. And in your mother's case, my understanding is she was she was taken at the age of four. Yep, um, four and, yeah, four and a half years old. So um, legally, they weren't supposed to take the children when they were under five years of age. So she was legally kidnapped from her front yard. A car pulled up. Her and her brother were playing in the front yard. A car pulled up. Two men got out. One grabbed her, and one grabbed her brother. Put him in the car and drove away and um two days later she arrived at the front steps of shingwa call a day later her brother arrived she already had her older brother there who she does not remember at all and um she never got to see him 
um, she, they were kept apart. So just think of having known your brothers next door and, and how you find comfort with being with family and your siblings. And you weren't allowed to do that, even though they were 100 feet away. So it's it, that's another intergenerational effect. But it's the, it's those things that you don't have the skills. You're not taught these skills. And I think that's um, the worst part of all of this is the no parental nurturing and how that affects all these children and then how it affects the next generation and the next generation. So it's it's just a snowball effect, but we can change it. When did you realize your mother's story? When did you learn the details and when did you realize that had an impact on your own relationship with her? Well, she, um, 1991, um, so, 1991 was the first Shingwak reunion uh, at Shingwak Indian Residential School. And um, she went to that reunion and she told me a little bit about it. And, and, but she never told me the details or the history of the school and what she went through as a child. Um, we knew bits and pieces, but we didn't know how harsh it was. And that's, that's pretty common place among indigenous people. Um, there's so many people that don't know their parents or their grandparents' history. And once they find out, then the, the light bulb turns on and they say, oh, okay, now some things start to make sense. But she, um, when she got there, she, she, she was fully assimilated and she knew what she had to do. She had survival skills um, way beyond what a five, six or seven, eight year old should have. And that's what she learned she had to do right away was create survival skills just to maintain. But in the end, she was, and she will be the first one to say it, she was fully assimilated. Mm -hmm. There are 72 children, as we say, buried at the Shingwak School, and that includes your mother's older brother. What does it mean to you to bring back all those mil missing children back home? What would that look like? Oh, man. Personally, it would mean so much. Um, and I knew my mom's brother was buried there, but at the time it didn't it didn't really soak in. But with 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 me being involved with um, Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, I've learned so much from the elders. And the more I learn, the more I realize how much certain things that that have not been recognized or they have asked for and they haven't been heard. Now it's being heard. And the stories that I've heard for the last 20 years um, weren't heard by others. They were heard, but they they weren't they weren't acted upon. So now they're finally hearing the stories and people are acting upon it. So I like to tell the story. My mom asked me one day, she goes, um, Jay, will you, um, I'm going to have put a weekend aside. Will you come up with me and we'll clean up the string walk cemetery? And I said, I'm on it. You name the weekend. I'll be there. And, and that's what we did. That's it. it she, she was connected. That was her home. Shing walk was her home for, for her whole childhood. So for her to go up there and take care of that cemetery with her, with her children would just meant the world to her. So those types of things, you know, where you see, um, just this little grassroots effort and just come into fruition. Um, it's just, it's, it just means the world to me. Jay, um, I don't have to tell you this country, every Canadian is now going through a moment of reckoning because of residential schools. And I want to thank you for sharing and trusting us with your story. That's Jay Jones. Thank you.